and welcome to WooStream, bringing Willamette to you. My name is Abby Kale, and I'm the Associate Director of Alumni Engagement here at Willamette. I'm also an alum from the class of 2005. And I'm Paul McKean, Assistant Director of Engagement Communications and an alum from the class of 2011. Today's conversation features Dr. Wallace Long Jr., who has served as the Director of Choral Activities at Willamette for the past 37 years. Dr. Long arrived at Willamette in 1983 and served as music department chair from 1994 to 2001. This year marks the end of an era as Dr. Long will retire at the end of the 2020 school year. Dr. Long, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. As Chamber Choir alums, we're excited to have you here with us. My pleasure. Thanks for letting me have this chance to speak with you. Um, for those who may not know, you originally went to school as a business economics major, wanting to work in the stock market. I think many of us alums are very happy that that didn't happen. <laughs> how, how did you make the switch from wanting to work in the stock market to pursuing a career in choral conducting? The change uh, in focus for my life came in my freshman year at the University of Arizona. I had gotten a scholarship to sing in the University of Arizona Symphonic Choir. And the musical, emotional, and spiritual experiences were so profound that it just kind of changed my thinking. I knew that music performance and teaching would be a lifelong passion. I had um, taken piano lessons as a kid and then stopped playing piano at one point. Then I uh, got in a rock band, played guitar. <laughs> I learned, I started learning um, to direct actually at nine years old mm -hmm. in our church. They had a training class mm -hmm. for little boys on Sunday afternoon to learn to direct hymns. And so every Wednesday night, I would leave the, lead the same hymn over and over again <laughs> every week. And so I knew that, uh, I mean, I, I love music, but I wanted to make money. And so I was going to be a stock uh, stockbroker. Uh, <laughs> but after that, uh, that first year, I switched back to being a music or switched to a music major in my sophomore year and never looked back. After college, you went to teach choral music um, in Arizona. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And then also how you found your way from Arizona to Willamette in Salem? Well, I finished my under, undergrad degree and began teaching high school in Tucson. I taught for six years and really learned my craft at that time. During the summers, I was able to go back and finish my master's in music education. And so by the end of the sixth year, uh, my choirs were winning contests, taking trips, performing at conventions, and I felt like I had learned what I needed to know at that level, and I yearned for more. So I went back for my doctorate in 1980, and I finished in 1983, uh, did like all graduates do, sent resumes out all over the country, and I, <clears throat> I got two interviews. One was at University of South Florida in Tampa and one at Willamette. And I was offered the job at both places. Um, and then I, but my decision was, uh, I don't know, based kind of just the, on the way it felt out here. I was born in New Mexico and went to school and worked in Arizona. So all I knew was the Southwest. Um, I mean, I really, start cruising at 103 degrees, I'm comfortable, <laughs> I'm out playing golf, whatever. Uh, when I interviewed at Willamette in March of uh, 1983, it was, it was just nuts like it is <laughs> in the Valley. Uh, I got up in the morning and it snowed. And then as I was headed to the interview, it rained. And then later on, it hailed. Oh my goodness. And then, <laughs> In the afternoon, it was beautifully sunny <laughs> and just just great. I thought, this is the craziest place in the world. <laughs> but it was just so green and beautiful because all I had known for my life was brown and cactus. Mm. And so it was so gorgeous. And the students and administration were so incredibly friendly that I took a leap of faith. I knew no one. I brought no one with me. I moved to Salem at age 30. Uh, all alone and got this thing started. Well, we're glad the rain didn't scare you away too much. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> um, tell us a little bit about wh what did choral music look like at Willamette when you got here? 
Well, I thought I'd start by talking a little bit about what music looked like back in 1983. Yeah. Uh, we had some wonderful directors. Uh, Bruce McIntosh was the director of the Student Orchestra and the University Community Orchestra. Martin Benke, my good friend, was the director of bands and jazz band. Uh, and they were, they were doing fine work. Uh, there was a marvelous fellow named Julio Viamonte, mm. who uh, had a, a great opera program going here. We actually had really strong programs in music education and music therapy at the same time. It's just, mm. just super. Mm -hmm. But the choral program was not particularly strong. My predecessor, twice removed, was this amazing man that many people know in Salem named Walt Ferrier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Walt had a very strong program with a great concert choir that even toured to Europe. Uh, and he had the Willamette Singers that did madrigals and pop music at the time. Wow. Uh, like Kingston Trio, Peter, Paul and Mary, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, under my immediate predecessor, whose name shall not be spoken... <laughs> uh, the program was not as strong uh, that individual was here for about five years and by the time I got here there was one choir it was called the university choir it had 60 members in it 19 of whom were tenor basses wow. as far as I could determine the uh, Willamette Singers had fallen by the wayside and was not being taught hmm. The other interesting thing about the university choir is that it was open without audition when I got wow. here. Um, uh, all music majors were required to be in an ensemble like they are now. Um, so it had any music major in it who could not find an ensemble or had an instrument that's not typically an ensemble instrument like classical guitar. Right. Wow. But, so you got to be in an ensemble. So guess what? You're in university choir. So it was this interesting mix of students from those that had a good bit of vocal, vocal ability and experience um, to those that had almost no experience to those that frankly did not want to be there at all. Hmm. And, and that's what we started with in 1983. It's interesting like that there was no audition process because it really kind of hampers how far the ensemble can go. And when they went from being as competitive as they were under Walt Ferrier, who is a delightful man, I've had the opportunity to meet him a couple of times, yeah. um, to just being an all-call choir, it's, um, it really hampers that, that ex the, the level of excellence that they're able to achieve. Absolutely. So it's hard to believe that the Willamette Singers that we know today uh, came came out of a madrigal group. Can you tell us a bit more about how this current iteration of singers came to be um, and what uh, vocal jazz was like in the in the early 80s? Well, upon my hire at Willamette, uh, my best bud at that time, the band director, Martin Benke, told me that he told me about the the defunct Willamette Singers and that the students would probably really enjoy a small group experience mm -hmm. if I wanted to add that ensemble back to our offerings. Uh, he also rightly, he's a great jazz musician as well, and he rightly stated that the Pacific Northwest was the hotbed of vocal jazz hmm. and was responsible for bringing the art form into the public schools. I mean, it really did. It started in Washington State, and then it's gone across the country. And he said that we would have a much better chance of recruiting students to Willamette if I added vocal jazz to our program. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem is I knew nothing about vocal jazz. <laughs> uh, I had experience, I had experience in pop music and show choirs, believe it or not, the choreography, the, the whole thing <laughs> uh, from my time teaching in high school. Uh, and I knew at some point about the history of the Willamette Singers that they had performed madrigals. So I decided, okay, I'll start by combining the two. I started my first semester studying madrigals because they're such a great tool to teach choirs how to sing together. Mm -hmm. Then the second semester, uh, we began to study some pop music and my first infantile forays into vocal jazz. <laughs> I, I really knew nothing about it. So I did some searching and found a vocal jazz camp for teachers that was offered in Spokane. 
and attended uh, every summer for three years to begin the art form. So then for about four years, the singers pursued a plan of doing madrigal dinners in the fall and vocal jazz in the spring. Um, and the madrigal dinners, it was just, I just loved the experience. We're all in tights and Elizabethan costumes. And <laughs> actually, the students would process in with a boar, uh, uh, a <laughs> peeled uh, skin boar on a, on a, it was just crazy and uh, had so much fun uh, doing that. Uh, we do it in the cat uh, every mm -hmm. fall. Hmm. But um, in the summer of 1987, I submitted an audition tape to the Music Educators National Conference to see if we might be selected for their national convention, which was to be held in Indianapolis spring of 1988. So lo and behold, uh, we were selected somehow as the only vocal jazz group in the nation um, wow. uh, to go do this convention. And we went ahead that year, produced our madrigal dinner in the fall. And then in the midst of that, started performing, uh, preparing for this national performance uh, in Indianapolis. Wow. So by the fall of 1988, it, it was clear the handwriting was on the wall we had transitioned, tradition, sorry, we had transitioned to a vocal jazz group for the entire year because we had moved into an elite category of nationally recognized vocal jazz groups. And it was just going to take much more time to maintain that status. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't do it in one semester per year. So that was our transition. What an incredible learning curve to, to come from no experience with the art form to then being a nationally recognized group and putting that all together uh, must have been quite an adventure. Yeah, the learning was pretty steep. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it's hard to imagine there's a time uh, in history where you didn't know anything about vocal jazz. That's right. right. Given, given where you are now, it's amazing. Well, I knew that you, you had stronger beats on two and four. That's what I knew. <laughs> Um, let, let's talk a little bit about the chamber choir, um, which is uh, very near and dear to, to my heart. Um, and in its history, you've had two signature pieces, uh, the first being the Lord Bless You and Keep You by Peter Lukin, and uh, of course, the Nuke Dimittis, which has just become a legendary piece. And of course, you have alumni uh, who are able to come back on stage and sing that, uh, which is a wonderful thing. Um, how did you first come across the Nuke Dimittis and, and when did it become a chamber choir signature piece? Well, the concept of a signature piece is an interesting one. I, my experience at University of Arizona was that we never had a signature piece. I never heard <laughs> one from uh, the big schools that I was uh, usually uh, listening to or seeing on tour. But when I came to the Northwest, I did some research and found that many choirs in the small private liberal arts institutions like Willamette do indeed have a signature piece. Hmm. Um, the university choir, as it was called when I started, adopted a wonderful signature piece that was called The Lord Bless You and Keep You, as, as you know, when I began in, in 83. And this piece served as kind of a benediction to our audiences which we share at the end of our concerts. It was a wonderful piece that I really love, but it's not particularly challenging mm -hmm. uh, musically. As our program developed and the choirs became better, I wanted something with a little more meat uh, to it for our signature piece. So uh, the way I found it is that my summers for uh, a long time now, actually 46 years of teaching, are usually filled with me playing hundreds of pieces of music at the piano during the summer and searching literature for the next year. During the summer of 1987, I played through the Nuke Dimittis of uh, Alexander Grachanov and just loved it. It's got uh, great stuff for sopranos. It's got low stuff for basses, um, powerful, powerful stuff for tenors and altos. And so that fall, uh, I taught it to the university choir and I actually found out that we first performed it on November 1st in 1987. 
Wow. And so it's been our signature piece ever since. Paul, I don't know about you, but I still remember the first couple weeks in chamber choir and having that Nunc Dimittis in the octet where you were just put with a random group um, and you had to sing it memorized and the amount of work. And that was kind of once you made it through that point, it was that was that was the threshold. And I still get a little nervous thinking about like having like be, how I felt trying to make sure that I didn't screw it up. Um, but I know that even now, like, I think um, we could all sing that starting note from memory. And um, yeah. <laughs> while the alto line isn't all that interesting at the beginning, um, it's still <laughs> something that I can get together with a group of chamber choir friends and we can just, you know, bust that one out. And it's, it's, it's so meaningful to, to all of us. And I remember, um, though a little terrifying to do that in the octet, <laughs> as soon as you finish it, you feel like I truly belong in this ensemble mm -hmm. and you feel, you feel welcomed, you feel ready. And I think without that kind of, um, almost initiation process, um, you don't, you don't yet feel like you've earned your spot in the group and that that's what does it. And then of course it becomes a piece that you carry with you for the rest of your life, which is just right. such a gift. Well, and it's almost like a, a rite of passage into that, into that yeah. chamber choir community. Um, and it's interesting. I find that in, um, in conversations that I've had with other alumni, they really talk about that sense of community within the chamber choir. And it's, it is so deep that I will meet an alum for the first time. And as soon as we realize that we were in chamber choir together, it's that instant connection. There's a bond and um, it's a really, it's a really fascinating, fascinating thing to have. And I know that there are, you know, other groups on campus, whether it was a Greek organization or, or another organization that was, you were really involved with that may have that same connection. But I think it's really unique and special within musical ensembles like chamber choir and the Willamette singers. And the fact that that, that sense of community has been able to continue on for 37 years is really impressive. So Doc, what's mm -hmm. your secret? How do you go about building that consistent community from, from one year to the next and, and have it, the strength of it just continues to grow? Well, I've thought about this a good bit and um, the secret is intentionality mm. in terms of team building, which leads to family building. Mm -hmm. It's been interesting to watch our family building traditions grow over the years. And they're a little bit different than they were when we when we first started. And I think my student leaders have helped to do a really good job at how we create family uh, in the choral program. So I, I this is going to be kind of a long answer because I really it's really important to me. And so I, I, I have some secrets that I will share. We won't first, tell anyone. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> um, there's the leadership structure. We have five officers that are part of the executive council, but three of those elected officers uh, that are on that council as a major portion of their responsibilities, they are supposed to help create an open, caring, receptive community. The vice president is in charge of creating a sense of caring family within the ensemble. The VP creates activities for students to get together two or three times a semester, just to have pizza, to bond, to do games, to do silly things that I think are important. Uh, the secretary actually plays an important role. Uh, that secretary takes role, um, but more important actually is that then weekly, the secretary and a student who may have missed rehearsal and I sit down in attendance meetings. Mm -hmm. We actively support the student and connect them with resources. If they're sick or depressed or struggling academically, we try to address anything that might be keeping them from the rehearsal rather than addressing absences in a punitive way. So it's, it's a way through the secretary to say, we care about you. Obviously, we don't want you to miss. What can we do to help you be here? Yeah. Then we have um, the historian. We ask our historian to take pictures of everything possible. The funnier, the better. <laughs> uh, 
uh, we post them on the choir bulletin board with silly captions. And we all look at the silly family activities in which we're involved and laugh at ourselves and laugh at each other. And, and that starts building. So then within our sections themselves, we have the traditional section leader who's responsible for, for helping the section learn its music. And then a very special role is, uh, is occupied by the assistant section leader who's directly responsible for the care of each member in the mm -hmm. section. We expect the uh, assistant section leaders to minister to those individual needs. I mean, if somebody is sick in a section, I want to be able to go to an assistant section leader and say, why isn't John here today? Mm -hmm. And I want that leader to have reached out to find out, well, how is, how is this base in my section doing? Why aren't you here today? Mm -hmm. um, the next building block, and this is kind of developed, you guys will remember over the years, is the retreat. Um, like most retreats, you spend a good amount of time rehearsing. Mm -hmm. We have our first sectionals of the year. Then we spend time playing games to help us learn names and something about uh, the members of the choir, who, the, who they are as people. But what we, what's developed over the years is... Uh, um, we, we now have this thing where we do skits. Okay. And students <laughs> are divided into groups of six to eight people. You guys may remember skits when you were in it. And you're given a bag of silly props. You have about 12 minutes to put together a skit and then perform it for each other. <laughs> now, over the years, it's funny how it's developed. Uh, uh, the skits now develop so that almost every one of them somehow makes fun of me <laughs> <laughs> and or Garnet, uh, my wife, or the incredible relationship that Garnet and I have. Now, it's interesting because during the skits, the loving insults start to fly my way. <laughs> <laughs> and I see the younger students immediately turn around, you know, see if, uh oh, is Dr. Long going to be mad? Is he, is he uh, scowling at this? And then when they see me laugh, and have a great time and, and just enjoying the fun, they kind of relax and go, okay, um, mm -hmm. I get this thing now. I mean, guys, I'm old, I'm big, I have a big voice. <laughs> I'm, I'm scary to lots of younger students. And when they see me relax and become more human, they relax and we start building the choir family. So then there are so many other things we do. Um, uh, after rehearsals, a lot of times members of the choir go to Gowdy and have chamber choir dinners. Um, when students have birthdays, I play this huge, crazy accompaniment on the piano to happy <laughs> birthday. And we all sing at the top of our lungs to students. Uh, and then there's tour where we live together for seven days, uh, which builds family. But at the end of the tour, um, there's something that I think is really special. I know you, you guys experienced uh, for our last focus, we have the touch someone who exercise where uh, you're allowed to walk around the room, various selector groups of people walk around the room and questions are presented that you know, touch someone uh, in this room who you feel like makes you feel happy every day. Mm -hmm. And so you just walk around and you touch them on the shoulders. Touch someone who makes you feel good about yourself. You touch someone else on the shoulders. By the end of those ex exercises, everyone's in tears every time mm -hmm. because you finally realize how important you are to your classmates and what a family we've become. So when all this intentional family building is accompanied by the incredible work the students do to form a high quality choir, the community of pride grows within the musical, uh, with the musical accomplishment, as does the closeness of the family. So that's our secret in <laughs> 3,000 words or less. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that I've pulled some of those secrets that, that you taught us as, uh, as chamber choir members into other areas of my life. I, mm -hmm. I deemed a high school music, art, and drama dance camp. And at the end of, at the, end of the, the week, we did a performance and that night at the campfire, we would do something very similar to touch someone who, because yeah. I think it's having that validation and realizing that you're, that you're a part of a community 
and that other people see you and appreciate and value you is, is one of those things that you hold with you forever. You use the the term ministering to, and it, 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 it seems like a great analog to a ministry where you're caring for that whole person and that whole person's need. And um, you recognize that good singing and, and exemplary singing doesn't just come from technique, but it comes from mental health, physical health, how you're doing in your classes, your stress, and you can't come and give it all if you're, you're, you're suffering in some other area of your life. And exactly. You get that sense that you're never just a voice. Um, you're not just vocal cords. You're a whole person. And that's, that seems right. so important to your, right. to your strategies. Paul, I don't know if this tradition was still there or if the, if the guys in the choir had this tradition, but when I was in choir, um, the, the sopranos and the altos would have a night where we would do a movie night together. And there was this movie out um, at the time called Sleeping with the Enemy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I know this. Now. <laughs> and um, the, the, the villain looks very, very similar to Dr. Long. And so <laughs> um, it was usually in the fall and we would be rehearsing for Christmas in Hudson. And I'm sure that the section leaders um, and the officers would cue him in to, um, to when we were watching this movie. But then during rehearsals, he would start to drop some of those lines like, that's okay, Abby. That's what reminding is for. And <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was one of those like shared experience camaraderie. Uh, pretty creepy. Yeah, pretty creepy. <laughs> but I know that there are a lot of movies that have become, become chamber choir traditions on the bus because you talk about those seven hour bus rides and so yeah. let's let's segue into tour a little bit because I know for for many of us that was that was the highlight of our of our chamber choir experience and um, I know some of my those are some of my favorite memories with the ensemble. Um, the group has toured all over the world from I know Japan to South Africa, New York, Hawaii, Montana, every other small town in between Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and California. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I was I was lucky enough to be able to go on the on the group with the group that went to South Africa, which was a life changing experience for me. So, can you share with us some of your favorite tour memories? Well, one of them is um, kind of far out in a way because it's not a specific place or or people. Um, one of the musical memories I wait for on each regular tour is Tuesday night. <laughs> Uh, I know you're going, well, what is Tuesday night? Well, as you remember how tours start, uh, we bring back the Willamette Singers on a Friday in the middle of uh, winter break, and they rehearse for a day. Chamber Choir comes back on Saturday, rehearses for a, a day. And then on Saturday night, we have some type of kickoff concert, sometimes in Salem, sometimes somewhere else. Next morning, we're hard at it. There's usually a church service concert on Sunday morning, concert Sunday night, two more on Monday, another school concert Tuesday morning. By Tuesday night, on almost every tour, the choirs finally really know their music. Hmm. And they start watching so much more carefully. They can spend less brain space on getting the music correct and begin to spend heart space on making mm. the music meaningful. So almost always, Tuesday night's concert is the best performance for both groups for the entire year up to that point. Wow. The choirs then become aware of just how good they are, mm -hmm. and they spend a tremendous amount of energy from that point on during the tour maintaining the Tuesday night level and then going above and beyond. Uh, another general memory, and you guys can probably share in, is homestays. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I love getting on the bus uh, the next morning after a homestay and hearing what people say. From scary homestays, uh, we had the tour where we went through small towns out uh, in Idaho where Students said their guns, rifles leaning up against the walls in the rooms <laughs> they're sleeping in, uh, to students having their own guest house in California, mm -hmm. uh, hot tubs. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. And then the next morning, they come back with tons of cookies and snacks. Uh, 
from these loving homestay families. But then some specific memories. Um, uh, back in 1995, we performed in the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, wow. uh, right across from the palace uh, for, uh, I think it was the celebration of 30 years of our cooperative relationship with Tokyo International University. Hmm. And uh, uh, I think they were also celebrating, I don't know how many hundred years of existence as an institution in Japan as well. So they flew in uh, three different groups from around the world. I was told they spent $4 million wow. on this huge celebration. Wow. Wow. Uh, we, were in, we were in this incredible ballroom with ice sculptures everywhere. Uh, the food was crazy and, <laughs> and we performed. It, it was really very special. Um, that was actually the second time we went to Japan. We also went in 1987 in March. And um, uh, no, I'm sorry. It was in, uh, I think, October in 1987. But we got to March in a harvest festival parade. And I was so out of place. I was this great big guy. They gave me a lantern to carry. Uh, <laughs> and all these people were less tall than I. And they're coming up to me it was really fun uh and that was in kawagoe which is our sister city for for salem okay. and we took a bullet train uh to go across country uh it was just so much fun we performed in an elementary school um no we performed in a library next to an elementary school and they were supposed to have the equipment and everything for us everywhere we went and they didn't have a drum set. And so we, the <laughs> library was next to an elementary school. Our drummer goes next door, next door and finds one suspended cymbal. <laughs> and, and a desk, a regular desk with a desktop. And so uh, they brought that back and we had our performance uh, playing one cymbal and desktop and the legs of the desk. And, <laughs> And everything, uh, it, it was really fun. Uh, then in, uh, I remember a great trip uh, in 1998 to Hawaii uh, with great performance venues. We had a big luau. Uh, we got to swim in Hanama Bay and see the fish and uh, buy the little underwater instrumentic cameras and take pictures of the fish. <laughs> um, but the, the crazy thing about that trip is that we were headed home and we had taken off and we were about an hour over the ocean. And the captain came on and said, um, we have to turn around and go back. Oh, no. Wow. We, have, uh, we have two navigational computers on board. They don't seem to agree with each other about where we are. Oh, no. <laughs> and they, so he said, we're going to turn around and go back before we get out too far and get lost. Oh. And... Uh, so we went back and we spent hours, hours in uh, waiting um, to, to get another uh, plane. So, of course, you know, the Willamette students, they all get up and start performing. We do every song we've ever known. Uh. Chamber choir singers, we just go on and on. And so, I mean, we draw a, a wonderful crowd and everyone's throwing money in a hat. <laughs> <laughs> so that was fun. Uh, <laughs> Certainly the peak of my experience at Willamette was, uh, as Abby says, the performance in South Africa, uh, the summer of 2004, mm -hmm. at the direct invitation of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, taking the chamber choir on a performance tour across South Africa was amazing, from singing <clears throat> with local choirs to going on safari to bungee jumping from the highest bridge in the world to singing in Archbishop's Tutu, Archbishop Tutu's home church in Cape Town. It was larger than life. Mm -hmm. We sang amazing music with all sorts of choreography and costumes. Um, but I thought it'd be interesting to just let all the alums know how this all came about. So we were invited to sing in South Africa because of a single piece. Mm -hmm. This is a piece I taught the chamber choir in the fall of 2002 called a hope for resolution. In the piece, an Anglican hymn 
called Of the Father's Love Begotten, which would have been sung by the Afrikaner people of South Africa, is juxtaposed with the underground South African anthem called Tulasizwe. And the, the arrangers crafted a composition where both songs actually work together. They're completely different in character, but by putting them together, it helps to symbolize the end of apartheid. Mm -hmm. Then President Lee Pelton heard the chamber choir sing the piece at Christmas in Hudson, December of 2002, and was brought to tears by our performance. So fast forward a month, and we're on our regional tour, uh, our exciting Eastern tour to Idaho, Montana. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was to be January of now of 2003. And I get a call on the bus from the president's office saying, Dr. Pelton is bringing Archbishop Desmond Tutu to speak in Smith Auditorium in late January spring of 2003 and he wanted chamber to sing hope for resolution for dr tutu well of course i said absolutely get us in there let's <laughs> do it so we sang for dr tutu and he is the coolest guy ever while we're singing he just could not contain himself he came out from the curtain and started dancing around mm -hmm. and and singing uh, when we got to the uh, Tula Cisway part uh, and just really engaged all of us in that performance. So then following the concert, I was called backstage by Dr. Pelton. And here we are in a circle with Dr. Tutu, his personal assistant, Dr. Pelton, my son, uh, Harris, who was 13 at the time, and me. And Dr. Tutu asked if we could come to South Africa to perform in his home church. And I said, absolutely. Uh, if we find the money, looking at Dr. Pelton, <laughs> smile knowingly. And so Dr. Pelton began the process of raising money for us. And, and the rest is history. So those are three of my big memories. Just a... Uh an incredible set of stories there. And of course, the South Africa trip is just, it's incredible to hear. I'd, I'd actually had never heard the story of how that came about and what an incredible journey that must have been. Right. And, and there's, if I'm not mistaken, there's a, a recording of the same name, Hope for Resolution, that, that you all put out with, the, yeah. with that song and lots of other songs that you sang on tour. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that folks can check out and hear some of that music. Yeah, I mean, most of that was recorded live uh, in South Africa, which is just amazing. And I think there's even um, on the on one on the Hope for Resolution recording, there was one school or something we were at where the kids knew the music or something, and so they actually sang with us. And I think Incredible. that's what's actually on the recording. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, there's there's that one, and then um, we learned the South African national anthem, and you can hear the the kids from the school. And I think it was in a town called George, because our tour director um, and his family were from that area. And George was always really a special town for me because we went and visited an orphanage there and spent an afternoon with with the kids from that from that school. We had our concert in in that one of the elementary schools. But then the tour director's family owned a restaurant that was in the middle of a cave that faced out onto the ocean. And so yeah. you, had to, you had to take a train to get there. Um, and one of one of my favorite memories from that day was singing the Nunc Dimittis in this cave that was lit by candlelight. And um, but it was just it was really neat. But I I listen to that CD often when I just need a um, just a, a boost of positivity because hearing those children's voices, it, it's outstanding. And it, it made for a great, a great song and um, contribution to that CD. So I don't know if you remember, Abby, when we were singing um, in Cape Town, we sang, of course, at the Archbishop's mm -hmm. Church, but we also did an outside concert in an mm -hmm. amphitheater there. And when it came to Hope for Resolution, um, and we got to the point where we started singing To La Cisue, the audience all started singing with us because this wow. is their 
ground national anthem. Wow. And, uh, the problem is that uh, the arrangers took the song as it is, but then kind of had to modify it to make it work with the Anglican hymn. And the audience actually hijacked the whole performance. They took it <laughs> over, and they just kept singing the two lassies way over and over and over. And we're trying to put the Anglican hymn in on top of it. <laughs> it was wild. And I don't know exactly how it ever finished, but somehow it did. <laughs> And that was cool to have your performance hijacked by, yeah. the, by the folks there. We also visited um, one of the townships that was right outside of, of Cape Town. And I mean, that's really where you where you realize how how lucky and how blessed we are to live where we live. I mean, it's just it was a different level of poverty than I've ever seen. But we performed for them. And that was my first experience with somebody showing gratitude and expre and expressing their feelings for a piece of music that wasn't what we typically are used to. This woman started um, calling, um, and it was um, it was kind of like a lip trail or something along the lines. But during the middle of one of the songs, that we couldn't, it caught us all off guard because we didn't understand. And one of our one of our hosts said, "No, no, no! She was she was in, like living the music with you, and just the spirit of the music had taken over her, and she was that's a way of expressing gratitude." And so, I I think it it just really shifted our worldview a little bit more and to to really understand what other cultures offer and how they express gratitude and um, it was really a fascinating experience as if we could top some of those stories um are, are there any other you know other than a cave and cape town and and some uh, of these incredible places are there any other venues that uh that you've sang in and that you've performed in that that stand out to you as being memorable uh yeah absolutely in 2006 the Chamber Choir, Willamette Choir alums, and I performed uh, Haydn's Mass in Time of War in Carnegie Hall mm. for a large and warmly receptive audience. Uh, and it, it was golly, standing on that stage and conducting with a professional orchestra, professional soloist from New York. Uh, it was one of the high points of many high points in my life. But one of my favorite memories came at the end of our dress rehearsal. The choir uh, orchestra and I were still on stage and the concert manager was out giving me notes and details about the performance, um, trying to get us all ready to go. And I believe it was Jeff Baker who graduated class of 2001, uh, started this 250 voice choir singing the Nunc Dimittis, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, down on my knees working with the manager, and all of a sudden, here is this sound. And I look up, and here are these incredible faces from alums uh, singing this special piece. And I just lost it. Uh, <laughs> it was really, really <laughs> neat to see that spontaneity uh, fill Carnegie Hall. Um, I mean, the performance of the Haydn was pretty cool, but the, <laughs> the, the, the Nunc was hard to beat for sure. Doc, if I could interject for a second, I think, um, so Carnegie keeps a pretty tight schedule on everything. And there had been a request to have us, if we could sing the Nunc Dimittis in that space where with you directing, and they had said, no, no, we don't have time. We don't have time. And so that was when, when you were doing the logistics, that's when Jeff decided to take matters into his own hands and just do it. So I think I mean, that, they, that <laughs> they couldn't stop us at that point. No. <laughs> uh, let's see uh, another one. Um, this is partly about the place, but partly about the performance uh, in 2012. The, uh, we sang at the American Choral Directors Association Northwest Regional Convention in Seattle. And they have a performance hall there that's, that's lovely. It's called the, uh, the Town Hall Seattle Auditorium. It was a gorgeous old church in downtown Seattle that had been renovated and converted to a concert hall. And we performed some really amazing music that year. And one of the things that sticks in my mind is we did this very difficult uh, motet by Palestrina for four four-part choirs, so 16 parts at once. Wow. 
And we did like the chamber choir often does. We, uh, we went out around the audience and positioned the four choirs in different places around the audience. And, and we just nailed that thing. And watching my colleagues' jaws drop uh, at the performance of the chamber choir was uh, very special indeed. So uh, that one sticks in my mind. And then, um, then the memories just get so jumbled of the many concert venues. I was looking back at our records and we've sung 29 state, national, uh, regional and international conferences and conventions with the chamber choir and singers. Wow. They all kind of blend together. Um, <laughs> but the thing that is consistent throughout each one is that they were all celebrations of the dedication and hard work of countless members of our choirs, each with a passion to continue our tradition of excellence. And so that uh, will be forever burned in my memory. One of the neat things that I um, that I really appreciate is that the the amount of musical talent in in the ensembles is is outstanding, and it's not just vocally. It's we have had some amazing writers and composers within the group, and I love that you give them the opportunity to um, to have their music performed while they're students on campus, which is something I'm not sure that a lot of young college composers get the opportunity to do. I know during my time, uh, Renee Schwab, as her senior piece, um, we we sang Ready to Go. Um, Nick Grant, who was the drummer for Singers um, and not a music major, if I remember correctly, um, wrote Our Dreams Will Never Die for Singers. And I know that there are countless others. Um, are there any that stand out to you? And um, and how does it feel when you pull those pieces back out and have future you know, choirs after those composers perform them? Yeah. Yeah, I remember those pieces and and uh, ready to go. I think I've used that maybe three times. Um, <clears throat> you know, some people just have an amazing ability, regardless of age and experience. And Renee did something very special. That that was actually part of a whole set that mm -hmm. she had done, and that one just particularly spoke to my heart. And so. Uh, in fact, we've done that at, a, at an ACDA Northwest, uh, one of our student compositions there. So they're very special. I, I, uh, I won't remember the titles, but I know, gosh, one of our early uh, chamber choir people, Vijay Singh, who now is the director of vocal jazz at Central Washington University, um, wrote some lovely pieces for the choir. One was called Dusk to Dawn oh, yeah. that we've done. That's one of our favorite pieces. He did a bunch of jazz things. Um, Matt Sazma, uh, who uh, uh, he and during his time at Willamette, there's also Derek Sup. Yes. Yep. Both of those folks wrote some great music. Matt even won a downbeat award as the best vocal jazz arrangement by a student for his wow. arrangement of Stella by Starlight for the Willamette Singers. Um, I don't know if you guys remember, I can't remember when he graduated, Darren McCoy yep. uh, wrote a wonderful piece for chamber choir. My son Harris arranged a piece for singers. Um, Lucas Anderson mm -hmm. wrote a great arrangement of the Irish Blessing and was in fact rewriting it for our alumni choir event that we were putting together for the end of this mm -hmm. year uh, before the coronavirus shut us all down. Uh. One particularly wonderful piece was written for Chamber Choir just two years ago, again by Matt Sazma. It was called Shades of Gray. Okay. It was composed to poetry written by one of our most active supporters, uh, whose name is Wes Robinson. Wes is a great fellow in this community that has come to our financial aid on many occasions over the last 20 years, and his poetry is just lovely. So Matt crafted a, a beautiful piece, which we sang for Wes at our final concert in April of 2019. So we've had a lot of talented folks come through. It's an incredible <laughs> legacy of, of music that has had a life beyond its original creation. That's, that's mm -hmm. incredible. Um, yeah, obviously, you've had such an impact on generations of students uh, throughout your career, including Abby and I. Um, 
But what are what are some of the paths that your former students have taken uh, after graduation that make you excited and proud and 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 show you that impact that you've had? Well, I'm excited by so many many of my students, regardless of their career paths, because at the heart of what they have chosen is to serve people, mm -hmm. uh, to just try and make things better where you land. I mean, just look at you, Paul and Abby. You're both incredible servants of Willamette and work diligently to improve the student experience in this place through the Office of Alumni Fair Affairs and through communication and development, Paul. Uh, you both do your jobs with such a sense, sense of passion and caring that I like to think your experience in Chamber Choir helped to focus and encourage. Of course, I'm... I'm very proud of all my students that became teachers at every level from elementary through uh, the chair of the Department of Music at Washington State University. Um, these students teach everything from music to chemistry, physics, English lit, theater. They're out there touching students with their hard work, dedication, and passion for the subjects that they're teaching. I wish I had a nickel for every time I've heard stories from their life experiences that include something like, Dr. Long, I learned some important words from you about us coming to rehearsals on time, and it's really <laughs> impacted my life. <laughs> and, and they repeat, if you're five minutes early, you're only 10 minutes late. Yep. And they try to instill that in their employees and their students uh, in their places of work. So. Uh, I think rather than individual specific careers, uh, the body of work that these students are doing, including you two folks, um, really speak volumes to the quality of, of the things you learned. I can't tell you how many times I've used that phrase with the master chorus. <laughs> Yeah. So I think I think I owe you some money on that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of nickels right there. <laughs> it's a lot of nickels. <laughs> well, that that's incredible of you to say, and 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 I think that the the lessons that you're mentioning there, and and what you've taught all of us as as your former students, is at the heart of Willamette's motto and what it means to be a Willamette student and and giving back and and bringing passion and. Uh, and that ability to to whatever community you're in. So thank you so much, Dr. Long. What advice do you have for students who are interested in pursuing a career in music and, and whether they you know aspire to be a director um, just like you? Well, I start off, I would start off with some negative advice. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you don't love students, forget it. Yeah. If you don't deeply love music, forget it. If you're going into this life for applause, forget it. Uh, if you're not willing to go above and beyond the call every day in every class for every student, forget it. But if you're willing to dedicate yourself to your students, then settle down, do the work, and learn your craft. This is a respected profession with a very high threshold over which you must step to get in the door. Learn how to play the piano well. Learn how to sing well. Take your theory and history classes seriously. Then after you've done all of that, go to work on developing the craft and art that is the conductor. Um, be curious about all forms of music. Don't thumb your nose, turn your nose up at anything, whether it's <laughs> rap, whether it's a cappella, whether it's whatever classical genre. Keep an open mind and see if you can gain an understanding of more and more forms of musical expression. Then after you receive your training and get a job, be filled with humility and go to work serving the population with whom you work and the music that they will sing. I mean, your ultimate goal is that you need to help them feel good about themselves as musicians and as people. So that would be my blessing to, to <laughs> teach. I think that's some great advice. Um, and, and one I know our alumni and the teachers that are looking to move forward will, will take to heart. Um, what have been some of your favorite cross-campus collaborations that you've done in your 37 years on campus? Well, one of our earliest collaborations was with Stas. Uh, <laughs> Stas Nostavrianias. Uh, 
who uh, is in the exercise science department, we were trying to learn this song uh, in Greek, a uh, Greek folk song called Kapios Jortasi. And I had no clue. Uh, and I saw his last name and I thought, well, that looks like a Greek name. <laughs> <laughs> I called Stas up and said, can you help us learn how to pronounce the, the lyrics in this song? And he was just awesome. He came over and uh, helped the students learn the music and then came to the concert and just, just loved the performance. So th that was one of our early uh, collaborations. Uh, and then we've had a couple of collaborations that I just mean so much to me, working with the theater, de theater de department. Um, we put together some pretty cool dance choral collaborations with Jesse Fouts, a uh, wonderful dance instructor, uh, EJ Reinigel, our, uh, who does aerial choreography and lighting and all sorts of tech work. Uh, just, just last year, we put together a wonderful performance of Eric Whitaker's Leonardo Dreams of His Flying Machine yes. with dancers and aerialists, uh, costumes, lighting, great choral singing, I mean, it was just absolutely magnificent. And um, that performance is now available on YouTube. Maybe one of the things we could do is to include a link or something in this that uh, the folks could listen to. Because it's, um, you know, we, we have to do things legally at Willamette in terms of deciding to put things up on YouTube. A lot of folks just throw it up, but it's really not legal. And so we went through a whole process with the publisher and Eric Whitaker in London, uh, uh, conversing with him and his representative. And it was really cool that both the publisher and Eric Whitaker came back and said, yes, please wow. post this. <laughs> and anytime you want to do more of our work and post it, please do. And so That's it incredible. was just kind of an affirmation that, that we did some good work there. So I would love to have the audience see that. Absolutely. We'll link that in the, in the show notes for sure. Yeah, and then we, uh, we've we had some, uh, some wonderful collaborations with my dear colleague, Chris Harris, from the theater department, uh, father of Aubrey Harris, who's uh, in the choral program. Uh, but he helped design our bistro-style jazz night in Smith that we had yeah. for a couple of years, um, helped with the lighting, helped with constructing stuff. It was amazing. Uh, then he helped uh, narrate and lend artistic vision to our spring 2017 concert called The Road Home, which was focused on the global refugee crisis. Uh, Chris has just been a total joy with which to work. And, and I think for those of us, thus of us on the choral side, we feel like when we work with the theater, we have to really bring our best because our theater is so very professional in the way they do things. So I like upping our game to, uh, to feel like we, we can collaborate with them successfully. And then I think, no doubt, the most successful collaboration has been with Professor Gene Clark from the yes. Rhetoric Program. Mm -hmm. Gene has worked tirelessly to help organize our Christmas and Hudson production each year. She writes the narrative that joins all the songs together and then narrates each performance with her amazing voice. Yeah. Uh, what a blessing to work with her. Uh, what a what an amazing colleague and uh, so talented. Mm -hmm. So those would be collaborations I remember. I think for me, Christmas in Hudson is something that my my family still continues to go to. I have an aunt who doesn't come to the Master Chorus concerts, but she comes to Christmas in Hudson every year because <laughs> for her, Christmas doesn't start until Christmas in Hudson. Yeah. That's and right. It's, it's a neat it's a neat tradition. Um, so five years from now, it's fast forward, and you look back at your time as a professor on campus at Willamette and the experiences that you have, what do you think will stand out the most to you? Well, strangely enough, um, I don't think it's going to be the music. I think it's mm -hmm. the incredible kindness of my students. Uh, seeing their faces and their hearts open up during performances has given me enough memories to last a lifetime. I will never forget the depth of their care for me during times of personal loss uh, over my 
37 years, uh, things happen. Of course, uh, I, I lost uh, both of my parents during this time, which would be natural. Uh, I lost one of my children, which was very unnatural, but it was all made more bearable because of the strength, love, and support of my students. Uh, finally, I guess I would remember just the, the thousands of parents and community members and colleagues who supported this program for four decades. Um, gosh, we just had full house after full house. Um, it's just been an incredible blessing to see the way people have supported what we've tried to do. So I have uh, one final question for you. And I'm sure our audience will be very curious. Um, what's next for you? What do you do um, after this amazing 37 years? Um, besides, I would imagine, take a nap <laughs> and relax a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I don't really know. Um, I've spent so much time focused on Willamette over these many years that uh, truthfully, I have not spent enough time, nearly enough time, focused on my wife, Garnet, our home, or even myself and my health. Um, it seems like I've said yes to almost every opportunity that has come my way. And every yes takes me away from home. Um, a retired school administrator friend of mine said, you need to say no to everything coming from the outside for six months. <laughs> just, just break it off from the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, figure out who you are and what direction you want to go and then, be go, then begin to go and serve again. So I would say uh, six months of no, Paul, <laughs> 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 from the outside and a lot of yeses to everything from my dear life partner, Garnet. And uh, uh, I think there is a honeydew list that is longer than I am tall. <laughs> so I'll be doing some honeydews as well. Incredible. Well, we'll let you have we'll let you have six months of no, and then we'll have to check <laughs> back in with you and and see what's coming up next after that. Thanks, Paul. Thank you, Abby. Yeah. Yes. Well, Dr. Long, it has been an absolute honor mm -hmm. and pleasure to speak with you today. Um, thank you so much for, for spending this time with us. Uh, thank you for saying yes uh, to, to, to spend some time with us and with uh, the whole Willamette community that um, will benefit from your, your life lessons and your guidance and your, uh, and your stories that you've told today. Um, Thank you also to you, our viewers. Uh, if you enjoyed this presentation, stay tuned. Uh, we'll be adding new content weekly to WooStream uh, where you can find interviews like this and lots of other programming. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at, uh, at Willamette Alumni where you'll find links to all the latest WooStream content. And uh, give this uh, video a share with a friend if you enjoyed it. Um, please share your feedback with us and send suggestions for additional content to alumni at willamette.edu. Thank you so much, Dr. Long. Thank you, guys. Take care. Be safe out there.